Good morning, Mr. Pearl. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Um, my name is Alan Benambu. Thank you for coming to be interviewed. Can you please tell me your name? Think about who these people are, who you're interviewing, and what they went through to be able to get here today. What they experienced and had to get through and to survive in order to be able to be here so that you could share in their stories. We should meet our survivors so we can know their story and know the pain that they went through. When you're seeing the Holocaust survivor face to face, you understand what they went through. Like you understand everything that they've lost and you kind of sympathize with them. I just rather feel the presence of a survivor. You get to know the person, you kind of like build a bond with them. When we talk about memory in Judaism, we're talking about a living memory, one which we are responsible for. This is a memory which is not meant to simply live in our minds. It is a memory that we have to act upon. We want to know the names of the people. We want to learn about them. If it's just like numbers, we won't learn anything. We don't want to count them. We want to know about those stories. Most of the concentration camps and labor camps, they gave all of the Jewish people or anyone who was sent there numbers. No one wants to be literally labeled. When the Nazis gave them numbers, they were trying to make them sound less like humans. Objects have numbers and like animals have numbers and it's like you're comparing people to that. So like saying that, no, we're not objects, we're not animals, like we're people, we have names. She said, you remind me of me when I was in Auschwitz. I was tall and she was tall for her age when she was in Auschwitz. I looked at you and I said, I was your height when I was in Auschwitz and that's what saved me. The Holocaust survivors are us. We're part of them and they're a part of us. And if we don't learn about them, then everything's just going to be forgotten about our history. Zachor, remember. The first association with the Holocaust is Zachor. Not just in your minds and hearts, but take action. Do something about the things in this world which you see are wrong. There's many things that we have to remember. This is one of them. If we don't remember and we forget about it, it's like forgetting about six million people. It's important to learn about the Holocaust because it's that's our history and we don't want it to repeat itself. Those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Part of this program is not just about the interviewing the Holocaust survivors and getting to know them and getting to meet them and hearing their stories. It's also about you being involved in the entire process. You're writing up your interview questions based upon you're going to be having a session with a journalist on Thursday. You'll be getting the biography of your survivor to know about them before you ask the questions. So that is really what this project is about, your way of learning and also your way of transmitting about what happened in the Holocaust. As you go through this program, think about the opportunity that you have in front of you. And the fact that you have this privilege to meet some of the last remaining survivors of this period in history, this period in Jewish history, which changed our nation forever, is a huge privilege. But it's also a huge responsibility. We can learn the stories and pass it on to the generation that won't have survivors anymore. And we need to hear the survivor stories understand what happened, what went wrong, and how to fix it so that it never happens again. We watched a video on Rabbi Folda. It showed me what the, like, what the end result should look like. I thought it was inspiring because kids are in interviewing these Holocaust survivors, and it sounds like they have so much experience with the interviewing, the editing, and the sound. Watching that movie, like, it showed me, like, oh, okay, if other people do it and we have the opportunity to do it, then we should also do it. Turn and look at the teenager next to you, who after the Holocaust, after a few generations, is still going to a day school or high school to learn Torah. Is still davening every day. Is still a Jew. That's the miracle. You're the miracle. My great-grandmother on both sides our survivors. My great-grandmother, we called her Saptophrania. My great-grandmother is a Holocaust survivor. My mom's grandfather. I have a great-grandmother who left before everything got bad. I never had a grandparent who was in the Holocaust who could teach me about it. And I think it's important for all the other kids who never had that experience. And so I hope that you will all gain so much from this program. I have people coming to me 
who did it years and years ago, who said it changed their lives. And they felt responsible to keep this story alive. My brother did the program last year. I thought it was a very cool program. I heard about this project by my sister. My sister. When my brother told me about the project, I was excited. When my oldest sister, she was in eighth grade, I went to see the, like, the film. And that's when I heard about it. When I saw the movie, I thought it was really cool. And I was really excited when I got to eighth grade and I get to do it. We're here to sort of tell you today that we've learned from 30 years of doing this and all these books, there is no right or wrong question. There's never a bad question. We had two investigative journalists. They came to teach us how to ask questions. The correct kinds of questions to get the kind of answers and to get the whole story. I thought it was very cool to have two journalists come to our school. What is critical and what will make you a great questioner is two things. You, to be a good listener and to be inquisitive. And there's never, ever a wrong question, mm -hmm. ever. I think that it was very helpful. You know, they're giving us hints of what's going to come. All of a sudden, that Holocaust survivor may start to cry mm -hmm. in front of you. They may choke up and ask a question. That may make you uncomfortable to see a person much older sitting there trying to fight back tears and you can't intervene and, and say don't or that. You have to let that moment play out as difficult yeah. as it is. Agreed. I shouldn't feel like nervous about asking these questions. I shouldn't feel like, like I did something wrong by asking these questions. I know it's going to be hard for them, but I will still, um, but I will still learn to appreciate what they're, what they're doing and coming and teaching us about the Holocaust. You're making a film that isn't only for your class and for yourselves, but for history. It's for going, history, yeah. for the future, for the next generation. And, and that has to, so if the, you've asked a question or brought up a memory mm. that brings up that emotion. But that's also a good thing. I first thought, okay, it's probably gonna be so hard since I don't, it's like we can't be like too pushy or anything. But then they told us if you're a little pushy, it's okay, cause you need to get the information. Try starting out, out with the who, when and where. And then as soon as, but also always listen for answers they give to expand on those and give more questions. To have a successful interview, I feel like you need to pay attention and care about the topic because otherwise you're gonna space out and it's just, you wanna interview someone about something that's important to you, not just something that's meaningless. Today we had a filmmaking class with Mike. I didn't expect our class on filmmaking to be so interactive and hands-on. So we're gonna learn how to do that. We're gonna, we're gonna practice, we're gonna do mock shoots. And one of the things we're gonna do is before we start rolling the camera, we're gonna make sure that this is the first thing you see. The techniques that I learned from this class was that the interviewee doesn't look into the camera like, I, like I'm looking right now. The shot sizes are wide shot, medium shot. And there's close up. We learned how to use the cameras and the slate and like all the basics to like filming. And everyone got to do a little bit of something. So there were things like checking the mic. It was fun learning how to use the camera and how to use that little thing, how to use the slate. It was really fun. For audio, one thing I should look out for is where they put the microphone on their clothing because it could probably muffle the sound. I really enjoyed uh, being interviewed by other people for like a, a quick fake interview, just to know what it feels like. How many siblings do you have? Josh Young, names not numbers interview. Action. Come on out. Names not numbers, Zevi K. Action. <laughs> so what's your name? Dovi. I'm feeling a little nervous but excited to get to know her story. I'm feeling nervous. I don't really know what to expect. I'm feeling very excited because this is a once in a lifetime thing to interview a Holocaust survivor and it's really special. This is like one moment in time that is super important and um, I think I should cherish it and um, hope for the best. I prepared for today's interview by reading over the bio, practicing asking questions so I wouldn't mess up. My group and I, we, uh, made a list of questions that helped run the storyline through. So it wasn't just a yes or no question, it was full stories and details. If you learn it from a textbook, you don't see the emotion, you don't see them. I'm just nervous because you can upset the survivors. 
it's really hard to see somebody who you've been asking these questions about and then you care about getting emotional and crying. Because I know how difficult and emotional it can be. So I don't want to push her to answer something she doesn't want to answer. I want to learn about them. I don't want them pulling away from what they want to say. I want, the, I want them to tell me everything. I feel like I could handle it. I knew that it was going to be emotional for the survivors because of what they went through, but I just prepared by just knowing that if they cry, it makes sense because of what they went through. I'm nervous because I've never really interviewed it. Not even a survivor, I've never really interviewed anybody. <laughs> so I don't know really what I'm doing, but I'm just gonna go with the flow and see how it turns out. Every Holocaust survivor has a different story to tell. I'd like to hear all their stories, you know, as much as I could hear. I'm feeling very confident and I'm very excited to interview her. Before, when I said that four years ago that I've always wanted to do this, and now it's like, it's like starting now also. So it's exciting. Samuel Rahn. I was born in 1924 in a small little town in Poland, and the name is Kazimierz Wielka. The name is bigger than the, name that the town was. My name is Joseph Pearl. I was born in Czechoslovakia, May 20th, 1925. My name is Anna M. Kahn. I was born in Monaco, Monte Carlo, February 13, 1929. Lily Glass in Brussels, Belgium, February 16, 1930. My name is Rosalind Haber. I was born in Czechoslovakia, 1931. My name is Martha Lichtman. I was born in Budapest, Hungary. I was born 1932, April 7. My name is Erika Spindel. I was born in Vienna, Austria. My name is Henny Galel. I was born in Leitzund, Poland. I was born in 1938. I was actually a very happy child. My mother was Zelda. My father was Josef. I had a brother younger, three years younger. Israel was his name. It was a small town, not a lot of Jews, and uh, my parents were actually, uh, my mother was more religious, my father was more progressive. It was a Jewish home. I went to uh, public school, seven years to a Polish public school, with actually were three Jewish kids and 50 non-Jews. I was the only boy and two girls. And then after school, probably when I was three or four, I went to a Heider and I had a Hebrew school and I was a member of a youth organization, Zionist, and Nora Tzioni. I was very, very good in Hebrew. I'm one out of 12 sisters and brothers. Father was a rabbi, a shaykhat, and a moil, all three. I went to a Hebrew school in a different city, not in my town. Got me a place to go to Chust. Chust was a big town, so. I went to Hebrew school there, town of Torah. A little before 1935, I was in a small village in, uh, in the Sierra de Gredos. And uh, my mother was a nurse and she was taking care of the whole village, a very primitive village without lights, without water, with nothing. My father was to care of, uh, he had jewelry, but it wasn't a store. He had it like a peddler, you know, he went to cafes and we were selling jewelry to whatever. My parents were not religious at all. Children I was playing with, they had grandmothers, they had cousins, they had all their family, and I never had anybody, really. I had my brother and my parents, but that was it. No, nobody, any holiday, we should celebrate New Year's or something. We were always alone. There was no nobody. I was just an ordinary kid went to school, Saturday went to temple. My parents came from Poland and they had a handbag factory. And my mother worked with my father, so we had a housekeeper at home. Her name was Angel and she was from Luxembourg, not Jewish. I had a very nice childhood. 
Uh, I was the only uh, first uh, grandchild and they took me places, children's theaters and outings and rides, beautiful places. My father was in the textile business and my mother was a homemaker. I had aunts and uncles, weekends, Saturday afternoons, we get together with in, in a beautiful park, uh, Shabbos, we kept, and, uh, and then I went to a Jewish uh, day school. My father was born in Poland, and he came to Austria. Uh, he worked as an electrician. My mother was born in Vienna, Austria, and she was a court secretary. I was indulged in toys and everything a little girl has. I remember I had a blue tricycle, I had a doll, and um, I remember that my mother took me to the park, to the neighborhood park. I remember that they lit the candles Friday night. But this is all I recall of that particular time. My father had, I, you know, he was in the cheder and he learned Hebrew and, of course, Polish and other languages because Russia is very north to that. And my mother uh, was uh, riding horses and uh, like a life, wonderful life. My grandparents, my parents, kept kosher. My grandfather from my father's side, he spoke 10 languages and he was like, not a rabbi, but he was like a rabbi. And they very, you know, covered the head and was very, very strict. I lived in Munkach. I had six brothers and I was the youngest and an only girl, only girl. I had a wonderful, wonderful family. My father, was a tailor. My mother was a housekeeper. When I was 11, the, my father saw to it that I went to a private Hebrew gymnasium, and I got my Hebrew education there. We were Orthodox. With six boys, it wasn't very easy to be as strict as uh, in some homes, but uh, we had everything that was Jewish, uh, Friday night, Shabbat, everything that was wonderful. We had a brave man. My mother just to give me some change or something, and I just to go, I knew the bread man, and I just, and I went out. And all of a sudden, the bread man was not standing up. I was laying down on top of the bread. And I could see some red sprinkling down the bread. It must have been blood. They were shot. My parents were saying it's not so safe anymore. They were killing neighbors to neighbors. They didn't like if you were not a communist, you got killed. That's it. Hashem actually told us to get out of, the, of the, where we were for safety reasons, somehow. And I was complaining, but it was fine because every time we went to another country, all right, I had to learn a language, another school, another children. I hated the apartments and all that, but, but, it, but we were safe. I was in the fifth grade. One of the kids in back of me called me, dirty Jew. You know what Sam did? I took the ink, we had ink, with the, the, and I spilled on him, and now I stood up and I said, who is dirty now? <laughs> and the class sat there. So, so I was, I, I did not suffer as anti-Semitism in Poland. That does not mean there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland, particularly in the, in the 30s. In the 30s, there was a lot of, lot of big troubles. They threw stones at us, and the dirty Jew it was a lot, a lot of turmoil, but we, we couldn't stop living, so we just went on with our everyday activities. It was a Friday night, and they were knocking on the door, and they said, in the Hungarian army's name, open the doors. 
and they took their bayonets and they went through the glass window where the milk and the food was on Friday night for Shabbat. They broke the door and came into the house and they said for my father to get dressed in the Hungarian army's name, uh, we're here to arrest you. And I was screaming, nobody takes my tati away. My tati is not going anywhere. And I was screaming so loud and holding on to him. And they tried to pry him away from me and they just couldn't. And after a little struggle, they said, okay, you be ready. Six o'clock in the morning, we'll come for you. You be ready. And they left and they didn't show up. And my father went to shul. And so we knew that the Hungarians were a problem for us. I was looking out of my window from the third floor. There was a whole group of people on the sidewalks and all, and in a slow-moving motorcade was standing Adolf Hitler. This was when Austria became a part of Nazi Germany. I just about entered kindergarten, but I had to leave right away because Jewish children were not permitted in schools anymore. Then came uh, November 9th uh, in that same year, 1938, which was called Crystal Night, Night of Broken Glass. They burned all the synagogues in Germany. They killed a lot of Jews. They broke all the front doors of the Jewish stores. That's why they call it broken right there. At that time, thousands of men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. And my father was among them. And he was taken to uh, Buchenwald and Dachau concentration camps. My mother tried to go to the various consulates and they told her what she needs to do is to travel to Berlin where the Nazi headquarters was once she has the sailing tickets for Shanghai, China, because this was the only country that accepted you at the time. No other country took the Jewish people, not even America. Upon proof of those tickets, they released my father. This was after nine months. Together, the three of us traveled on to Marseille, France, where we boarded the ship for Shanghai, China. Hitler was a very famous speech he gave, we had no radio, then I went to the neighbor and I told my mother that, uh, and my father, that I heard that uh, he was a very dangerous man. And then every day was more and more the anti-Semitic problem. In Hungary, uh, who was not a Hungarian citizen, they lock them up. They are from Poland or from somewhere. And then we, uh, my mother prepared food for Shabbos and we took them. And we thought this is because they were not Hungarian citizen. But unfortunately, after that, it was uh, when the Germans came in, we had uh, a lot of, uh, that's when the problem started. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. On September 1st, Danzig is incorporated into the Reich and all Europe is aflame. World War II is a reality. They got all the Jewish people together and put them to camp. Before the war, my father walked out in the street Every non-Jew bent down to him, respect. And kneeled down to my father. Before the war, before the Nazis came. After the Nazis came, 
everything changed. Same people, they broke our house, they broke our house to pieces. They tore the shit trick of the walls and everything, They're looking for money. I took the parents away right away. The Nazis came and went to the houses, to everybody's houses, and chased them out. So, and then they uh, had a ghetto. What happened, we had to leave the house. The Polish were afraid to talk to Jews or hide Jews. So I think what we went to the forest after, because the partisans were there. But my mother, she was really, really courageous because nobody could send, go back to the house when they, the Gestapo and I was there, there in the house. And so she told, she went in, she said she's looking for something, something uh, you know, some pictures or whatever. So they let her in, this was in the beginning. So they were not so uh, horrible that later. And she came out, this was the border, and she said, and the, on the border was somebody standing there and said, yeah, it, so he saw hello or whatever. Do you have money? My mother said, yes. And he asked her, how much money do you have? So she told them maybe $50 and some cents. If I'm, it's Lota, it's another money. And then he said, oh, just go. We wind up in, in Siberia. When we were there, my mother got very, very sick. She was malaria, dysentery, all, all kinds of things. And she was in quarantine for nine months. When she came back home after some this period of time, I didn't recognize her. They shaved her head, and you know, and I didn't recognize my mother. So, of course, I ran after, under the table, and it, it, I didn't want to go to this woman. She was really looking terrible, you know, whatever. Also, in Russia, some uh, uh, people that came from the war or came over, and they came over. It was very bad. It was lice and was very, it was terrible. So my mother used to really wash them and fell them. We were lucky a little bit with the bank in Russia, if I bring Russia, that my father was a dentist. The Russian people, they uh, like to have golden, golden teeth. They didn't have much something to eat, or they didn't have this, but they did. My father, we were really saved from hunger, probably, when he did, and he, he didn't work for money, he worked for flour. And if you have flour, you can do something with it. I never felt hungry. We needed someone to take care of the three of us. So they, my parents hired Angela. She was not Jewish. So she went to the Germans and told them that she's one of them and she wants to have a card showing that she's pro-Nazi. And they gave it to her. Once the Nazi took over Belgium and Brussels, they went to every apartment with, that they had a list where the Jews live. So they came to our apartment and she put us under the bed and she opened the door. And when they say, Jews live here, and she says, no, I live here and I'm pro-German. Look, I wear whatever she wore, you know, showing that she's not. So they apologized and they left. We picked ourselves up and started walking towards France because from France you can go to Switzerland, which is neutral. All we had was the clothes on our backs. That's it. Because we had to walk. There was no transportation anymore. Just leave a home that you grew up in, and then all of a sudden you are on a highway with thousands of other people. That's scary. Then we came to the Belgium and France border. There they told us that men have to go on one side, women have to go on the other side, because the men had to go to the army at that time. It was me and my two brothers. They, they are twins. They were four at the time, and my mother. We continued into France, and we lost touch with my father. That was it. 
On the 5th of September, the German army walked in my town. That day, our life turns upside down. We lost our dignity, our freedom, no schools. We're not allowed to get out from the house after six o'clock, not to live in the town. They took the business away. Age 12, you have to have an armband. It was a white one with a blue market of it. If you didn't wear, you got shot. Any, any punishment was dead. They start they, slave labor. At age 16, men and women had to work for them, so whatever place they had. We were in Milano, we got uh, an apartment, and I uh, used to go downstairs to play, and there was one street next to the, to the apartment building, which was paved, and no cars and nothing. We used to roller skate all the time there. The English came and threw bomb all over the place. We used to go down to the basements. Every child took toys. I took a, ba a bag of bread. A lot of re refugees were coming from concentration camps and everything, and uh, they went to a Jewish organization, and my mother opened up a kitchen, or a kitchen she was cooking for them. And this Jewish organization, these people who came, came with coupons. So they could give my mother a coupon for their meal, and then my mother took all those coupons, went to the, the organization and got paid for it. I knew something about that, where, you know, the Jews were, uh, you know, were not treated right because I could see all these people in my uh, apartment in Milano. But uh, it's something I wasn't in my, uh, you know, I wasn't thinking of all that. I was, children, uh, especially that time, we just had toys and we played with dolls and stuff like that. There were a couple of uh, Italian policemen who just to eat there all the time. Thank God for those two policemen because one day they did come and they said, you are on the list to be arrested, get out. In the middle of the night, we all of a sudden, my parents took out the suitcases and we went to Rome. I found myself in the Vatican City. Vatican City is, belongs to, it's a principality, belongs to a church. So it was neutral, it's right in the middle of Rome. And they have their own soldiers and everything and nobody could go in there. Nazis were there already, they couldn't come in there or take you or nothing. So we went to this, there was a convent actually, and we ate there and we were there about 10 days. Then my father came one day and he said that he converted and we are Christians now. That German general by the name of Meisinger, they called him the butcher of Warsaw, Poland, came to Shanghai to propose a solution to kill the Jews to the Japanese. <clears throat> However, the Japanese people were not anti-Semite. They were very, very brutal people. They were very mean to us, but they were not anti-Semitic. They did not accept that plan from Germany to just send us out to sea and drown us or starve us. They refused to do that. But yet, what they did do uh, to please the Germans, they created this ghetto area, which was became the well-known Shanghai ghetto. We couldn't leave the area. It was controlled by the, sh by the Japanese, and eventually we had to have a curfew. My mother got a job in the yeshiva. The mirror yeshiva came to Shanghai via Kobe, uh, lots and lots of them, and she cooked for them. So ultimately, we had a little bit of better food as my mother brought home that kind of food and did not have to eat in the mess halls. The yeshiva created a little factory where they bake matzahs. They bake matzahs by hand. And my mother also helped there. So a few people were baking the matzahs by hand. And in turn, we could eat matzahs for Pesach, whilst the other people could not, did not have it. They started taking, deporting the Jews from the neighborhood. 
the chief of the Polish police told my father that Monday is going to be a deportation of our city. Saturday night, we walked out from the house, going to a, to a Polish friend six kilometers away and hid in a barn, seven people. But we all, the tragedy was that we had a grandmother, 92 years old. She couldn't walk, so we left in the house. You know how it was to walk out? walk out from the house and she was in bed and we knew that she was going to be killed next day. That's uh, talking about emotions now. So that's, so that's, we went in and hiding and other people went into the death camps. We smuggled ourselves into the ghetto. Krakow was not too far away. You know, we thought we were smart, but the Germans were smarter. They didn't care you go in, they wouldn't let you go out. When other people went to death camps, they picked a few of us asked for work. See, the German army needed workers. So the ones, we, they separate us and took, and took us for work. That's how we, some of us survived. They liquidated the ghetto. Then we went into the camp in Prashov. We were all four of us in the camp there. Separated, but together. I was transferred out of Prashov to another camp, Pionki. My mother was transferred to another camp, Skarzysko. And my father, my brother, in 1944, was sent to a in Austria, Mauthausen. The Germans came in uh, March 19. Next day, we had uh, rules and regulations that we couldn't go through the park, we, we couldn't travel, we, we couldn't have any help in the house. We had to wear the Jewish star. My father went to labor camp every day. They took some people and they wanted to take me too. But uh, I, uh, I said, I'm only 12 years old. So they, they let me stay. We had to go to a certain signed building where the Jewish stars was on. They took people out from the building during the night and they tied them together in the Danube and they shoot them. We woke up and our next building was completely empty. And then we were next, we were afraid what happened to us. And in a few days later, we saw people, uh, Jewish people with uh, hands up and they were marching, uh, we didn't know where, to the Danube on the right or, or the ghetto. And a few days later, it was our turn. And they took us to the ghetto in January 6, 1944. We were taken to Munkaj ghetto a day after Pesach. My three brothers were in Munkatabor, which was a working camp for the Hungarians and the other three boys went with, with my parents and I to Auschwitz. I don't know how many of us were in the train, but we were jam-packed like sardines. And I remember I was with my mother in a corner and uh, people who, who had to go to the bathroom, they had a, a little bucket we weren't allowed to cry, we weren't allowed to talk, we weren't allowed to do anything. It was terrible. My mother tried to shield me from everything. My father just would say to me, be a big girl, everything will be all right. Just be, take care of your mother. When you sit in the cattle car, and you don't know where you're going, it's terrible. And then finally, when you get out someplace and they walk you out in the shower room, you don't know what's gonna come out there, gas or water. Then water came out. You know what happened? We were singing a Hebrew song, Mayim, Mayim, Chaim, you know that song there? And I was four times in cattle cars, moving from one camp to another camp. The name of that second camp was Pionki, then a big ammunition factory. 
And then after, after the Red Army captured half of Poland, they stopped in the summer of 1944 at the Vistula was the river. My camp was five miles away from the river on the other side. So they decided to move all the Jewish prisoners in the Audi camps west to Auschwitz, to Buchenwald. The manager of the, of, the, of the factory got a permission to move the machinery to Germany to rebuild the factory. He didn't want to go to the army. So, so he picked 300 of us to take us to Germany to rebuild this factory there. So I wind up in a new camp in Sachsenhausen. Eight months, we were really hungry. They woke us up like 3, 30, 4 in the morning and go, walk out outside. It was cold. We wear these pajamas, you know. And then there was a roll call. 30,000 people in the camp in the roll call. It took an hour. They, could, they didn't stop until... I could never figure out what they worried. They'd lose one or two people like this. Yeah, but that doesn't work this way. So after the roll call, we got coffee. It looked like coffee. Yeah. And then we went out to work. And you come back from work, four or five, I don't know what time, they gave us soup. The closer we got to the war, you couldn't even find a piece of wood in that soup. And then Sunday gave you two slices of bread. From the Danube into the uh, ghetto area, it was a horrible walk because it was bombing. Uh, machine guns was going, it was cold, and uh, without any food. And uh, we got, uh, uh, my aunt and uncle came with us, so happened my uncle came home earlier, and uh, he brought even mattress that I shouldn't sleep on the floor. And we got into the ghetto, they took everything away from us. And uh, <clears throat> we, we tried to find a place to stay. It was all bombed out. It was no windows in January. was no <laughs> bare floor, and the floor was full of soot. We wanted to come to the United States. We didn't have enough papers. So my mother said we are going back to Spain because she had the, in the cemetery had the little daughter, you know, who was buried there. And we went with a black car that had two flags from the Vatican. So nobody could stop him. Barcelona, if anybody was in Barcelona in 1940, it was after the Civil War and it looked destroyed. The big ramblas, the big avenues, there was no trees. There were bullet holes all over the, the apartments. There was nobody but beggars. It was pretty bad. My father came and said, uh, you are going to get a better education in, uh, in a convent. I didn't know I was going to be hidden in a convent. I knew that, that I went to school for a better education. And uh, the, I got all kind of clothes for the convent and everything because I didn't see my parents for two years. In the beginning, I was very sad. It was, I think that was, I didn't see my parents anymore, and I didn't see anybody. And my mother had a German friend there in Madrid, and she came once and took me out and took me to a movies to see Goodbye, Mr. Chips, I remember still. And then to a tea room to have some tea, and then she took me back to the convent. So that's the only time I went out. But uh, as I said, I think that was that I felt like somebody dumped me or something like that. I wanted to have a family like my girlfriend said. I went to their homes, the Spanish homes, and they had the, the grandparents and they had the cousins and they had family and they celebrate holidays. And I didn't have it and I didn't know why my parents couldn't have a regular, I would call it a regular life. But we were safe. There was a reason why we had to run away all the time because we didn't have a home and it was dangerous. It wasn't an easy life. I think they, had a, they didn't have a life, both of them, I think. The Nazis really treated us like they treat the one in Germany. So my mother went to the priest and said, we have to hide. 
So he contacted some people. My two brothers went into an orphanage. My mother went into a farmer's place, and I went to a convent for girls. The convent was in a village, and the village knew that they had some Jews hidden there. Some of the people came to the convent and said, the Germans are coming. They put us in the attic, and that's when we found out who was Jewish. Before, we didn't know. There was about 10 of us there. I felt good that there were other girls that were like me. We smiled when we passed each other, but we never talked. It was like a school, so they closed for the summer. And then my mother picked me up for two months. And living with her, that was very scary because she was in a farm and they put her in the attic. When I came, they put me in the attic and we were not allowed to walk during the day. We had to stay in bed because downstairs they would hear. I felt that Catholics have a better life than Jews and nothing would happen to me if I'm Catholic. So I asked them to baptize me. When we arrived in Auschwitz, they were screaming, Raus, Raus, Schweinhund, Jude, Raus. We had to jump off the train. The Jewish prisoners told us to, uh, to try and stay together, and they told us what to do, and they told me to, when they're asking me how old I was, that I was 16, and my mother was under 40. You see a lot of people there, sick people, dead people. We were treated like animals right there. My father was taken right away and we arrived in Auschwitz. I never saw him again. My mother and I were together for two weeks. I saw my brothers once when they walked past our barracks and they, they were looking for my mother and they threw a handkerchief for her to cover her head because we were all, they shaved our heads. And we arrived to Auschwitz and my mother put it on. One of the women who was head of the bunker said, where did you get that? She said, I found it on the ground. She gave my mother a, with a whip across her head and that was the end of my mother. We had say lapel every morning, every afternoon and every night counting us all the time and uh, Mengele the butcher, the, the Dr. Mengele, came and uh, he pulled my mother out. And I said, I'm going with my mother. He said, your time will come. And the girls pulled me back into the line. And they said, just stay here, don't, don't say anything. And they took my mother away after two weeks. I was in Auschwitz, Grossrosen. Then I went to Rachenbach, Niederstadt. I went to work every day, and they gave you food, and that was it. I volunteered to work every morning. Five o'clock, I was up, volunteered to go to work. 
If you didn't go to work, they used to beat the hell out of you, beat you and kill you. Every morning, five o'clock, I was up, volunteered and go to work. Whatever work they gave me, construction, carrying bricks, carrying lumber. We were in a camp and it was an electric fence all around the camp, the electric fence. So during the night, we went out, we were ducking a hall underneath the fence and put a dirt in our pocket and dumped it someplace else. About 10 or 12 guys of us finally made the hole big enough and we decided to escape and we escaped the camp. And finally I couldn't run anymore, I couldn't walk anymore. So I knocked on the door and a little lady came and helped me up to the apartment. And her husband was a Nazi. So she says that her husband comes home she so put me in the sta stable where the cows are on top of the hay. And I was standing there and she was feeding, she gave me a little food every day, something to, su to survive. I was in a, in a camp, Sachsenhausen, and there were 30,000 people. And I think April, I know, 11 maybe, we walked out from the camp. So when we walked out in the camp, they gave us a loaf of bread for the six people. I cut it up, I got my part, and I finished it on the spot there. For the next two and a half weeks, we were given no food. No food given for the next two and a half weeks. It does not mean we, we scrambled all kinds of flowers, a lot of potatoes, whatever. But uh, the first week, the first week, you walked, Anybody walked out from the line got shot. The second week, anybody walked out, they didn't care. So they let the lick in the ditch, and they didn't bother. The war in Europe ended, but not in the Pacific. So the American front finally came and bombarded the Japanese, but they also knew that the immigrants, the Jewish immigrants who were living in that ghetto area, every single day we had bombardments. You know, but around us, they tried to hit the Japanese. However, there was one day as the American planes came over Shanghai, they flew very, very low. They could not see because it was a cloudy, a foggy day. They couldn't see anything and they dropped their bombs right in the middle of the ghetto. So on that day, we lost our people, 37 people plus hundreds of Chinese were injured and were killed and hundreds had to enter the hospital. We were detained in school on that day. It happened at one o'clock. So afterwards, after one o'clock, they released us to go home. And we had about a half hour walk to get to our camp or wherever we lived. And we had to walk over the dead bodies and injured bodies and the blood on the street when the sirens blew one that means they left the Americans and that was a disastrous day. The worst day for all of us, which we will never forget. I was sent to Bergen-Belsen and uh, got very sick with typhus. They wanted to take me to the hospital, and everybody in the hospital was, they were dying. And there was one woman who knew my brothers, and when she saw me so sick, she said, I will save you. Her name is Lucy Jacobs. She took me out. She wouldn't let me go to the hospital, and she saved me. We were liberated by the British. I was frightened from the bombing and 
and the machine guns, and I want to go to the basement, and my uncle found out that we shouldn't go to the basement because the Nazis came in and they were shooting whoever they found down there. We found out that um, we had some relatives in the school building, and that was stronger, so we went there, but we couldn't stay upstairs because the machine gun was top of the building. So we went to the basement, and it was a lot of people in the basement, hundreds of people. All of a sudden, we heard horrible noise, and we held hands, and we said, this is it, now they're coming, and they're gonna kill us. The partisan came, and, and the Russian soldiers came in, and they liberated us. That was January 18, 1945. I was 12 years old. The British Army was coming in, and the Germans were running away. On May the 2nd, 1945, at midnight, the guards disappeared. And we were left in the woods there. And you see, I get up on my feet. I was walking with my friend. I had a lot of friends on my body and other lights, you know. And I'm not sure if I had one shoe or two shoes, you know. And then, and then you walk out middle of the night and, and you don't know what to do. I was liberated in Northern Germany, May the 2nd, 1944. I spoke a little English at that time. And we got close to the trucks and they said, we are British and we are here to liberate you. Well, most people didn't speak English. And I said, how is that possible? They're here to liberate us and they're soldiers. What's going on? When Truman came on the radio and said, that the war in the Pacific is officially over. We Jews were celebrating on the streets and we ran out and we hugged each other, embraced each other and were crying and all. And suddenly the Japanese disappeared, you know, and the ghetto boundaries were open and we were free people and we could go and do whatever we wanted. A few days later, the American Navy arrived. They embraced us, they came to us, and to us children, they handed out candy bars and chewing gum and, um, and took us for rides in their Jeeps and showed us American movies, and they even taught us to play baseball. We went back to Poland. It's a, a, a town that is called Szczecin. And my father, so he went with my cousin, a cousin of mine, went to see the city, what's left and whatever. When they came, it's after the war, and uh, they couldn't find, they knew where they live. Somebody lived in their house. They sent trucks for us to pick us up and to take us to the DP camps in Berlin. My sister was uh, still a baby and, and nobody could talk at all, make noise or something. A Russian driver, and he was the driver from the truck. He got very afraid. The Polish didn't like so much the Russian anyway. So anyhow, that what happened, but he didn't know it Russian, but he knew that we escaping without any permission, any nothing. So they took us back. 
And the Poland, they put us in, in, in uh, not my aunt, my aunt wasn't still there. They put us in a prison. I, uh, I was already six or something. Thank God to my aunt, she was out with her children. She, you know, she paid the money and they let them go. But in, when they in the prison, what was, it wasn't a prison, it was like a room with rats running around and was a piano. So can you imagine our people that really survived in the world, say, in this condition? One played the piano. When my mother picked us up, we knew that the Germans were retreating. We took a train back to Brussels, and Angel was at the apartment. So we were the lucky ones. We came back to a normal life. My mother also picked up my two brothers that were twins. And I was still a child, so I didn't remember them. And all of a sudden, I was reunited with them. And then a normal life was something I didn't know about either. I felt safe, but I felt strange, like it's not my life anymore. My mother has become not religious anymore because she doesn't believe in anything. My father was in England during the war, so he became very religious. If God brings him back, his wife and children, that's what he wanted. Because he was in England, he didn't know if we existed. He didn't know if we were, had taken to camps or so on. So after the war, he got in touch with the Red Cross. And for some reason, it's the Portuguese Red Cross that found us. I went back home to my hometown and uh, to get my family together. The, the city next to our town, they had to give you help. They fed you there, they gave you food, gave you what thing. My mother was liberated in Gross Rosen in March 1943 by the Red Army. My brother died in Mauthausen, a, war, a month before the war. My father survived Mauthausen but he spent the whole year in an in a American hospital. I went back to Poland. I went back to the city of Krakow. And in the city of Krakow was a Jewish committee already uh, for the, helping the survival. And there was a book on the table. Everybody came write his name. Before I wrote my name, I flipped around the pages and I found my mother's name. And meanwhile, I found my father too in a hospital in Austria. We didn't know about Auschwitz, that my grandmother was uh, uh, on the train and, and my aunt and two children, two cousins, they were gas. We were freed, but uh, after the heartache came that my father didn't come home and and my, my other, a lot of people from uh, who was in a concentration camp, didn't come back. We went back to to claim our apartment, to move back to the apartment, and they said, no, 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 you cannot come back because the, the Germans will come back. We lived together again with other relatives until uh, we, we found out that uh, my father was um, well, he was 50 kilometers from Budapest, and they were trying to come in, but the Germans and the Russians, they, uh, they were uh, surrounded in Budapest, so they couldn't come in, and he died. Uh, they were hunger and had no clothes. It was very sad. It was a big disappointment. We had no idea what was going on in Europe during the war. We did not receive any mail, nothing. We, we were just shocked 
to read what happened and of all the people that were lost. We wrote to my cousin, United States, that he's I am who we are. And uh, my cousin was Einhorn supermarket. He had a, about 20 stores, supermarkets. So he sponsored us to come to the United States. By 1947 only. The trip to America, we went out to Cadiz, Spain. Very, very pretty town. And uh, went to a ship, Marques de Comillas. 1947, my mother remarried. My mother and, and my second father had to come in. They came in January, and my mother was very upset to leave me behind the Iron Curtain but uh, the American consulate promised that in three months I'm gonna be able to come to this country. So I arrived and um, really April 29, 1949, I came to this country. I was 17 years old. I was together with my family, you know I mean? Not that I didn't live with them, but I was working in the house. So when the time came and they asked me to go to Israel, I didn't know what to do. We had an uncle in, in America who came here in 1905 or six, my, my father's brother. So my parents, my parents got papers to go to the United States and I was in Israel and my parents didn't want to go to America. So I wrote them letters First of all, go to America. You always can't come from America to Israel. You know? So they went to the United States, and I was in Israel already. It took my father 10 years, all kind of tricks he had to get me to America. So I finally got to America in 1955. My husband was from Germany, and he left in 1936 to Israel, but his brothers and sisters and the others didn't. They spent the war in camps. After the camp, they were del delivered by Americans. So they came to America and they found out that they have a brother in Israel and they said, no, we have to be together, one family. You can't stay there. So we came here. My mother's brothers lived in the United States and they wanted us to come to America. I was the first one to arrive two days before Thanksgiving, 1948. It was a joyous reunion with the family. I said, what a great country. You come to America and uncles that you never knew are there waiting for you. And uh, it was just heavenly, just heaven. Everybody, of course, was Jewish and very happy to go to Israel, to, you know, finally. And, uh, it, the, but it was a horrible trip. Everybody was sick. But you know what? We came there. We, it was unbelievable. The le welcome for the people and it's absolutely great. I knew all about New York. I saw pictures and all. And here it comes into the harbor and I see those skyscrapers and the Statue of Liberty. I saw the Statue of Liberty. That's the first thing I saw, and then all the tall buildings and stuff like that. It was a, a very exciting moment to see the, the Statue of Liberty, yeah. Once we saw the Statue of Liberty, we all were singing and dancing. It felt like everything, like a million dollars. It mesmerized me. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I had to pinch myself <laughs> that I was finally in a free country. I was dressed up nicely with a pink <laughs> skirt and a, or a pink blouse and a beige skirt. Because I'm coming to America, my hair was fine and stuff like that. I was thrilled to finally, you know, finally we came to the United States. I was uh, very happy that I was here and I was with 
with the family and with my mother. It was a very nice feeling. A nice feeling that my father said that we had the freedom, that nobody was telling you you were Jewish or you were Christian or you were whatever. That's a nice feeling. That's the best feeling. As a child, you heard of Holocaust survivors and you heard their stories. But now you've grown up, it's not important to you, but it is. If not, it's going to happen again. Find out all about what was going then, so it shouldn't repeat. When people were silent, the Holocaust happened. We never want that to happen again. Not enough, you know, uh, to tell you that you'll be a good person, you, you have to be an example. You shouldn't be silent, you should stand up. We always have to remember, speak up for what you believe is, is right. We have to do everything we can, and we can't just be a bystander. You could be like an everyday hero and not even know it. You could be doing something so small, like, like smiling at someone, and it could change the whole world. That was help, so I like to help somebody else. I just feel that you should never ever hate because hate uh, creates war. You can teach someone that like you shouldn't hate someone for that or like hate that in general. And then they'll just grow up learning that and like maybe that type of hate will be gone. Be kind, be good to your parents. Don't let bad people take over this country and just work for the good of people. It's always nice to know what happened. The world should know about the Holocaust and that we should never forget about it. Sharing it is just the most important thing to do right now. My husband, he called himself not a survival, he called himself a witness. So I think I'm a witness too. If people like me didn't share their story, it's going to be forgotten. It's just going to be pictures at the museum in Washington and New York. Rachel's children, and we carry her name. We are Rachel's children, and we light her flame. We see her strength, her dignity. We know her sacrifice. We are Rachel's children, calling her name. We are Rachel's children, and we bear her pain. We are Rachel's children, may it not be in vain. Buried alone, Bethlehem wrote, no peace within her soul. We are Rachel's children, crying her name. Children, 
angel's children more than 3,000 years. We are angel's children and we share our tears. May we learn, may we return for days of all we earn. We are angel's children. Together in prayer, we are Rachel's children, now and forever. Survivors of the ghetto, scars that still remain. We are Rachel's children, crying her name. Jerusalem